Well, my background uh, in terms of the very beginning goes back to when my parents uh, immigrated to Canada and uh, I was born t two months after they arrived and the, their first five years in Canada were extremely difficult but I'm too young or rather was too young to remember that um, so th we lived, it, seven of us lived in a, in a farmhouse in uh, the Simcoe area and well there was no there was no bathroom no kitchen no running water so it was a very very difficult existence and uh, that's that's how we started out um, in terms of of the immigration experience affecting me um, because I was born in Canada I wasn't affected as much as my older sisters um, I adjusted fairly quickly and I just remember being really proud of being Dutch and um, and just um, feeling you know lucky that I spoke spoke two different languages and and I wasn't really aware of the hardship and it wasn't actually until I was 12 years old that my girlfriend inadvertently informed me that we were really poor that hadn't I hadn't noticed just hadn't noticed and then I actually it wasn't until I was 20 and again a friend said to me Rosemary you're not Dutch you're Canadian and that that was sort of like a second shock and it wasn't until that point in time that particular incident that I accepted the fact that I was Canadian first and uh, in Dutch second so there were little things like that of course and um, you know I was aware um, of the differences in our in our behavior uh, the way we reacted to things uh, food um, little customs that we had in the house uh, that kind of thing but it wasn't until till I got older that um, I saw how the immigration experience had affected not so much me because I was the first person in our family to get uh, a degree and a graduate degree at that but my older sisters who had to forfeit their educations uh, completely you know, they have grade 8 uh, in order to you know work they had full-time jobs and they handed over their paychecks to my parents or the bulk of it and that's the way it was done and uh, if my sisters hadn't done that, and they did it quite willingly, uh, we, we would not have gotten ahead. Um, we would have remained uh, desperately poor. So that was not an uncommon thing then. So it, it certainly impacted my older sisters a lot more than it did me. And, um, and of course, it wasn't until I was growing up uh, and got older that I realized the impact it had on my parents um, because they came at 35 with with almost five kids and so they never really became Canadians in the way they wanted to they they always um, felt like second-class citizens they always felt like foreigners with their thick Dutch accents and it was very painful for me to witness that and to, and to see them trying so hard and, and struggling and, and to never achieve their goal of being, feeling completely comfortable in Canada. So those are the ways, you know, in which I felt it, shall we say, being a, an immigrant. I think, oddly enough, my, um, my, my parents were not artistic in any way, but they produced seven artistic children. And so that was an odd thing that we never figured out, but it meant that my two gifted sisters were constantly drawing and painting, and I was a younger one, so I was copying my, my big sisters, and we were all, you know, making art um, in the family in that way. And then I excelled in art in school, and then when I went to, to high school, and was graduating, um, Ross Bateman, who was teaching at Simcoe Compass's school at the time, who's Robert's brother, um, told me that I had lots of uh, talent and encouraged me to apply to art college. Uh, a number of things, very, very personal in my case. Um, I 
started out at graduate school um, because I had very little life experience, just painting things that I was very familiar with, like the North Shore of Lake Erie, or objects that I loved, <clears throat> the antique marble collection that my sisters had brought from Holland, or marine flotsam and jetsam, shells, um, eggs, bones, things like that. Um, and then as my still life work matured, um, uh, I started um, being more influenced um, and inspired by my various interests in geology and astronomy and spiritual matters and I very consciously brought that into the work and, um, and that uh, it made, it, it made the work a, a lot more interesting as I, as I matured as an artist and uh, uh, there was more meat to it, um, and then eventually, um, as as life progresses, I experienced pain, I experienced loss, and that entered into my work. And then there was death, and that informed my work. And um, and then at, at the last exhibition I've done, my most impo important show uh, to date, uh, it was about the immigration experience. Um, my, what my family went through and my need to document that. So it's really, I guess, um, personal, very personal things that my work comes out of. I started out at Humber College and after two years of uh, watching my instructors uh, at their jobs, I, I knew that that's what I wanted to do. It just seemed like the perfect thing for me because it was sharing what I loved most um, with other people and um, sharing my accumulated knowledge and my, my interest in art um, with adults. That, that seemed like the ideal job. And uh, from that point forward, I um, you know, worked towards that goal of being an educator and an artist. I mean, realistically, how many people can support themselves on the sales of their paintings? So I knew from the beginning that I had to have a job as well and, and um, teaching was uh, what I witnessed um, at the beginning of my career and definitely wanted to do. And um, when I was at Humber, um, I, um, ch I chose that particular school, I digress a little bit, but I chose that particular school because um, their program was absolutely fantastic and after two years at Humber you could get right into your third year of uh, your BFA at the Nova Scotia College of Fine Art and Design which is exactly what I did. Mm -hmm. It was great and um, it was different because I had been to Althouse College in the meantime uh, and uh, so now I was qualified to, to teach at the elementary and secondary levels and uh, so it was a lot of fun. I went there, I actually got um, artist in education grants. That's how I started teaching at Matthews Hall. And uh, it was the oldest, it's the oldest uh, um, private school in London. Mm -hmm. And um, I was only there for a few years, but um, they really appreciated what I did yeah, so when I left Matthews Hall, uh, Pat Doig, the head, and Catherine Hegley, one of the parents, um, really appreciated my efforts at that school and the way I had raised the bar. Uh, and so what they did was uh, create the Rosemary Sloot Art Award. And that actually consists of a stained glass window that runs the width of the, uh, the entrance doors of the school. And it was created by Lynette Richards and uh, one of the panels um, in the window c contains you know the text uh, Rosemary Sloot Art Award so I am invited back to that school every year to present that award and um, so that's pretty pretty exciting pretty special and uh, and I hope that that continues for a very long time mm -hmm. you know that for ye for years to come um, de generations to come, they're still handing out uh, the Rosemary Sloot Art Award and thinking about, you know, the excellence of art at that school and each year a, a student trying to achieve that excellence and win that award. Well, um, there were, well, I'd say 
the very first and the very last, perhaps. Um, when I was, uh, it was 1978, I was graduating from the University of Alberta with my master's degree, and uh, I uh, applied for and got a Canada Council B grant, and I also found out about this fabulous initiative coming out of um, the um, art gallery in London, Ontario, um, and um, it was called Young Contemporaries. And the curator, um, Patty O'Brien, she was traveling Canada from coast to coast, visiting artists' studios who were under 30, and putting together this uh, exhibition, group show, and then that show would travel the country from coast to coast. So it was the thing to get into. So she somehow found my work in Alberta, and uh, I got into Young Contemporary 78 and that launched my career and um, it was also my first introduction and the beginning I suppose of my becoming part of the London art scene um, because I remember going to um, the art gallery to meet uh, Patty O'Brien and um, see my work there and uh, there was a brand new um, commercial gallery that had opened up in town, um, Studio 487 Gallery, and that curator, or rather that uh, dealer, uh, she picked me up uh, right away, and so she was picking up a lot of really good uh, London artists at that time, and so uh, I was one of that group of um, some of the best artists that were working in London at the time. Uh, and I got to uh, to show at that gallery and be part of the London art scene. So it was, yeah, well, that was a, s a special special exhibition for me. And uh, then the most recent uh, would be uh, my show called Immigrant, uh, which deals with my family's immigration experience um, from the Netherlands to Canada. And uh, that show um, generated a tremendous amount of interest. And um, the public response to the work was phenomenal. It was a very worthwhile project. Mm -hmm. I'm really, really glad I did it, as hard as it was to do. So, it, like emotionally, it was a, a very difficult show to do mm -hmm. because, you know, I was grieving the loss of my, my mother and, uh, and, uh, and so I'm chipping away at the show and, and, um, you know, at the very beginning, I was weeping as I painted. I mean, it was, it was that emotional. And then my, my siblings would come into my studio as I worked on it for six years, and they'd come into my studio and they'd start crying and, and they said, this isn't good, you shouldn't be doing this, this is not healthy. And I even had a brother-in-law come into my studio and said, that's it, you've got to stop this, no more, you have to stop what you're doing here. And, uh, and then, of course, once the show was finished and it was hanging on the wall, uh, they became my biggest supporters and they couldn't get enough of it, enough of seeing it. And, and it was sort of, it wasn't until it was hanging on the wall that my siblings got it. You know, they really, really got it. And, and they appreciated it and said, I am so glad you did this. And, you know, our parents would be so glad that you did this. You know, but uh, but it's you know art art making can be um, challenging in that way where you um, you have to uh, you you put your heart and soul out there and hope that you're doing the right thing. Mm -hmm. Well, um, I've I've mentioned the the Matthews Hall Award. Um, that is one thing, and another thing would be the uh, the immigration show, because um, I was asked to give a slide presentation uh, of that show at a local art group, and they were so excited by that presentation, and they were so stimulated, um, and inspired and encouraged to to do something themselves that they a couple of the uh, the artists in the group uh, put together a very large uh, 50 work um, group show uh, about immigration and um, they it was called uh, home and away and, and they produced a very thick beautiful catalog and um, 
all the people that entered that exhibition uh, had an opportunity to tell their immigration story uh, because they, you could submit two or three works and you also had to, in so many words, write your immigration story. And so these stories appear in the catalog um, beside the, the paintings. So, um, and they were very, very generous uh, in, in recognizing my show as their inspiration. So they asked me to hang uh, six pieces from my immigrant show in the main gallery. And then they had big letters across my work uh, inspired by Rosemary Sloot. So I walked in and thought, oh, isn't that nice? And um, they are in the process of, of taking that catalog and putting it into schools and putting it into libraries. And they feel that they want to do more. So they're thinking about A Home and Away 2, Part 2, and maybe an exhibition that will travel. Um, so it's, uh, it's stimulated a lot of artists uh, in London and, uh, and we'll see where it goes. Well, um, I can't imagine a society without art in it. You know, even people who say, well, I don't go to art galleries and it's, you know, I can't relate. Um, there is music and there's theater and there's fashion and there's architecture uh, and, and there's literature. Um, it's, it's a huge, uh, all-encompassing um, um, profession, shall we say, and I can't imagine a society without those, all those enriching things in it. And um, I think that um, um, the arts in society are not unlike the, the canary to the coal miner. And if the arts are suffering in a society, or if the art, arts are being destroyed, uh, as we see is happening in the Middle East, then you know that there's something terribly wrong with the society. Uh, and, and war is a good example and how art suffers during a, a, a period of war. But uh, when the arts are flourishing and people are so enriched by those, those arts, um, then I think it's, it's an indication of a society that is healthy. And, and that is uh, functioning uh, at its best. Well, um, I guess I would like to be remembered as an artist who produced a good body of work and who influenced my learners. I, I have taught at all levels, uh, from university to elementary. Um, and I hope I've influenced my learners in, the, in this area to, to make great art, to make the best art they can. I've, uh, I've you know, accumulated a no lot of knowledge. I, I became quite an expert painter. And, and when you're able to share that with learners, um, you give them the tools. You give them the tools to go on and, and make their own great art. So I, I guess I want to be remembered as a good artist and a good teacher who positively influenced um, a lot of people, in, in, including adults, um, who, who I've been in touch with uh, one way or the other um, through, through lectures and, and critiques and all, all the other things that I've done. You know, I, I don't know. I mean, uh, as a woman, you approach things differently. You know, as a teacher, I'm going to teach differently than a man teacher or, you know, and, and maybe, you know, maybe some of my paintings would be considered feminine. Um, but in terms of my making a, a, a different contribution or, uh, and this is not what you want to hear, but um, because I'm a woman that my contribution has been specific or different. Um, I don't know. I get, maybe I haven't thought about it enough. But uh, I know that this, is, this project is focusing on women. So, um, and the contribution women has made. Well, I do, I do know that it's certainly harder to get ahead when you're a woman. Harder to get the jobs, harder to get the exhibits. 
and, and that was interesting to me when I was going through school because the majority of the students were female. The majority were female. And then when you graduate, the majority were male who were getting the dealers, getting the exhibits, getting the jobs. It was majority more male um, by far. But in the schools, majority women. Yeah. So that's something I was aware of um, when, um, when I was a, a student and, and trying to find a job. Um, the, the assignment was to take a piece out of the permanent collection of the Macintosh Art Gallery and, and bounce it off what we were doing ourselves. So we got to pick the piece and then hang it beside my paintings and make connections and draw relationships. And her piece was clay and it had text on it, which was entirely different than my highly illusionistic um, shadow images of my husband and I on the surface of water. But um, there was also the, um, the piece I had that, that had the, the clay breastplate in it. That was also the shield um, was in that. And that's the piece that was hanging right beside Margot's. And um, that particular painting um, had um, um, you know, it, that p p particular painting was, um, among other things, was about breast cancer. And, uh, and, and it, there, one half of, the, uh, of my shadow um, is covered with a, uh, um, a, a ceramic um, breast plate. Um, and I was comparing that piece of, you know, sort of broken, crumbled, um, peeling ceramic with Margot's piece, and um, and that was that was by a, another artist. Um, but um, yeah, I was you know comparing those two pieces, and I guess you know choosing choosing a woman's breast and dealing with breast cancer in that is again something a, a man probably would not have done. And um, so yeah, I, I hadn't thought of that uh, as as being something feminine, but certainly. And I, I was attracted to Margot's work right away. And um, I was at Humber College, and we had to write a paper about a contemporary Canadian artist, a paper. We had to just write an essay, I'm sure. And, um, and I was going through textbooks and whatnot, and I saw one of Margot's uh, white clay pieces. And I said, wow, I love that. I love this artist. I've got to find out more about her. And so I found out that she was from London, Ontario. And so I made my way to London, Ontario and uh, went to her house. And she and her husband, Herb Aris, very kindly gave me tours of their, tu um, tours of their studios in their house. And, uh, and then I sat down and interviewed her uh, to write this, this paper. And that was my first year at Humber. So that was my first connection with London. And then, and then the, the second connection with London happens, um, you know, when I get into young contemporaries as an Alberta artist. And, um, and then I'm choosing Margot again, much farther on in my career, to, to do that, that comparison piece uh, with one of my own works, which is interesting. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And at the moment, I'm working on a, an exhibition for Museum London, and it's feminine. And I, it would be very interesting to see how people react to it, because it's, it's very feminine. I am, I am painting, I'm trying to paint, I'm just, just starting the first painting, but I'm working with um, uh, a, a tiny dresses that I wore as a baby. And uh, my thinking is that these are the dresses that my mother gave me when my husband and I were trying to have a family. And, and you know, my pregnancies failed and, and the adoption failed and it was all terrible and miserable. And so I never did have children. But these, um, these dresses that she gave me that are already 30 years old have been laying in my 
drawer for another 30 years and I pulled them out the other day and I thought, wow, these are the dresses that my daughter never wore. And that just something clicked. Something clicked and I, think, I thought, I think I have to do something with this. But they're pink and they're blue and they're flowered. And I thought, oh boy, this is going to be a challenge. You know, to do something that's powerful with such difficult subject matter as babies' dresses. Yeah, we'll see. <laughs> we'll see. But uh, I'm still excited about it. Yes. So again, again, that's a very personal thing, and uh, and something that has emotional content for me, and. Um, very, very personal, and but that's the kind of thing you know. That's where it comes out of. You you see something like that, and you start thinking about something like that, and and um, and that's that's what uh, inspires my work. That kind of thing. You know, occasionally, the work is inspired by you know s something political that's going on. Um, I remember when, when uh, Quebec almost separated from Canada and I was working on a landscape painting and then it became, because of that, and I was so worried about it, it became a multi-canvas piece and it was called Two Views of the Path. And uh, there were two views of the same path going in different directions and it was a landscape. And, and so that, that yeah, it was, it was obvious. And, and there have been other incidents like that where there's something going on in the world or or there's... You know something that's uh, that's you know bothering me so much that it it, it it just enters in you know it just enters into the work, um, but that's only happened occasionally. I'm not a political artist, and you know I'm not concerned with with a lot of formal things um, like artists are, are maybe concerned with with the color or 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 some kind of minimalism or abstraction or you know various formal concerns that artists have. I've never been that kind of artist. Uh, I've never been um, uh, a real political artist. It's more very personal, personal stuff. And um, you know, a long time ago, uh, someone said to me, your, this was when I was doing the still life paintings, you know, I, th I think when I was at uh, the still life paintings were at, at their, their best, their best. Somebody, and I don't remember who it was, said, your work's very feminine. I can tell when I look at your paintings that they were done by a woman. And I said, oh, is that so? And, and I deliberately, after, I, after that comment was made, I deliberately did a pink painting, a pink painting, and I thought, well, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> If my work is feminine, it might, I might as well make it super feminine. And I did a, a beautiful pink painting, and it sold like that. <laughs> it was it was just funny. It's a funny thing, but um, but yeah. So people have said that about my work. Now that now that you you know uh, are stimulating my memory. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And and so I guess. I guess uh, my contribution is not overt, but it's, it's subtle. And it's just the fact that I am a woman that I guess my paintings will look a certain way or I will approach certain subjects a certain way or I will, I will tackle subjects that a man would not tackle, like baby's dresses. And, uh, and then I bring that, I guess, that femininity into also working with my students.